Starship finally took to the skies for a second time. We had a long duration burn of the Ariane 6 core stage and North Korea sprang a surprise. It's Friday the 24th of November and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. Sponsored by Brilliant. Now, the observant among you might have noticed I'm not Alicia. Don't panic, she's just on holiday. She'll be back in a couple of weeks. And with that out of the way, let's talk about some space news. This week, we had some really interesting news about crew missions set to take place from the US in the near future. At the latest meeting of the NASA Advisory Council Committee, Philip McAllister, Director of the Commercial Spaceflight Division at NASA, announced that Starliner's crew flight test is currently tracking a launch date of no earlier than April 14th. That launch date, however, hinges on Starliner successfully clearing a parachute test set to take place in January to fully certify that system ahead of putting humans on board. If you remember, Boeing had to delay this mission back from this summer to next year to redesign the parachute soft links as well as replace the tape used on the capsule's wiring as it was deemed potentially flammable under certain conditions. This tape replacement has been successfully completed so finally it looks like everything is trending positive for Boeing's crewed spacecraft. On that same note the Canadian Space Agency also announced this week two crew assignments for upcoming crew missions including Starliner's first crew rotation mission to the ISS. On one hand we have Joshua Kutrick who is set to be a mission specialist on the Starliner 1 mission, which is set to take place no earlier than February 2025. This will be Joshua's first flight into space and the first flight of a Canadian astronaut to the ISS since David St. Jacques returned from the station in June of 2019. Then on the other hand we have Jenny Gibbons who has been selected to be the backup crew for Jeremy Hansen, one of the mission specialists for the Artemis 2 mission. That'll be the first crewed flight back to the moon since the 1970s. If all goes well for Jeremy, she won't get to fly on Artemis 2, but who knows, perhaps she could have a chance at flying on a later mission. And just before we head into this week in launches, I'm going to toss it over to Sawyer, who has a word from our sponsor. Hang on, let me just finish this cold dropped? How come the ISS can talk to the ground so often, and I can't even talk to someone down the street? Turns out, science might be behind it. And today's sponsor, Brilliant.org, has a great lesson all about it. Brilliant.org is continually adding new math, science, and computer-related lessons to their library of thousands that make learning easy. I've been loving their course on how technology works, and I just finished their lesson about how wireless communication works in general. It's super easy to understand the literal ones and zeros that go into sharing messages wirelessly, and it's interactive too. So I guess right now that I'm riding on a wave of phase, does that make me David Bowie Starman? I guess not. But you can get a 30-day free trial by going to brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight or by clicking the link in the description below. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Anyway, let me try contacting the ISS. It's probably easier than using some phone providers. Let's see, 1-800... Oh, I'll send it back to you while I do this. ISS... And now let's take a look at this week in launches. A Chengzheng 2C with a Yuanzhong upper stage lifted off on November 16th at 0355 UTC from the South Launch Site 2 at the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center. The rocket was carrying the first Haiyang 3 satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. The Haiyang constellation is a series of remote sensing satellites for oceanic observations by the Chinese National Satellite Ocean Application Service. The Haiyang 3 satellites will complement the Haiyang 2 satellites by taking highly detailed measurements of the water color of multiple different types of water bodies. This Falcon 9 lifted off on November 18th at 0505 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The mission, Starlink Group 628, was carrying a batch of 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this flight, B-1069, was flying for an 11th time and successfully landed on the drone ship. Just read the instructions. Another Falcon 9 launch took place from Vandenberg on November 20th at 10.30 Universal Time. This was also another Starlink mission, Starlink Group 77, carrying 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1063, was flying for a 15th time, becoming the fifth booster to reach this milestone. As usual, the booster returned to a soft landing back on Earth, touching down on the deck of SpaceX's drone ship, 
of course I still love you. And I guess third time's the charm as North Korea's Charlie Ma-1 rocket finally reached orbit this week after two prior failed attempts earlier in the year. The launch took place on November 21st at 1342 UTC from Launch Pad 2 at the Sohei Satellite Launching Station. The mission was carrying a Maligyong-1 satellite, just like on the two previous attempts, into a sun-synchronous orbit. The Maligyong-1 satellite is North Korea's first military reconnaissance satellite and the third satellite launched by this country into orbit overall. This was also the first successful launch of the Chungi Ma-1 rocket, which had to perform quite the weird dogleg manoeuvre after liftoff in order to not drop stages on other countries. Another Falcon 9 launch took place this week on November 22nd at 0747 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The mission, Starlink 629, was carrying a batch of 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The booster for this mission, B1067, was flying for a 15th time, rings a bell, becoming the sixth booster to reach this milestone. It successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship, a short full of Gravitas. With three Starlink launches this week, SpaceX has now launched a total of 5,490 satellites, of which 368 have re-entered and more than 4,000 500 are in operational orbit. A Chengzheng 2D rocket with a Yanzheng upper stage lifted off on November 23rd at 10 UTC from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. The launch was carrying three satellites into low Earth orbit. The nature of these satellites is quite uncertain though, with Chinese media only citing the payload aboard this flight as carrying a technology experiment for satellite internet. China's state-owned China Satellite Network Group has had plans for a few years to launch its own internet satellite constellation into low Earth orbit, so these three satellites may perhaps be prototypes for this constellation. And the big launch of the week was obviously Starship's second test flight that finally took place this week. Liftoff took place on November 18th at 1402 UTC from Starship's orbital launch pad A at Starbase, Texas. You probably know by now that this launch came after almost seven months since the first flight. These months were spent on repairing the launch pad after the first flight left a crater underneath it, retrofitting the booster and ship with upgrades to fix the issues during the first flight. We had a bunch of stackings and de-stackings of Ship 25 and Booster 9 and well, we also waited for a lot of paperwork to be completed. Alicia did a great job on last week's episode of This Week in Space Flight, summarising all the paperwork that had to be done, so do check that out for a full rundown. Thankfully, all of this work was worth the wait, and a lot of the fixes put in place seemed to work really well on this flight. For starters, there was no crater under the launch pad this time around. The new water-cooled steel plate worked as designed, and no concrete was thrown around. We also had, for the first time, the successful ignition of all 33 Raptor engines on Super Heavy. Yes, 33 engines. This perfect ignition of all the Raptors on the booster finally let us see a really amazing side effect, that is, the Mega Mark Diamonds. These seem to pop up as a result of the interactions between all of the engine exhausts producing several Mark Diamonds in the overall rocket plume, as if it were just one big booster with one big engine underneath. The first stage of flight was so great that we couldn't resist turning these shots into metal prints for our store at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. We're currently running a special Black Friday sale up until Monday where you can get a discount on metal prints, hoodies or other products and that includes the metal prints we got from this flight. And once you're around the shop you can also get some knitted sweaters and beanies from our special holiday collection as well. We're past the time where this merch is guaranteed to arrive by Christmas, but you can order some just to keep them around for the rest of winter. They're cool designs and they'll keep you warm. Or I guess if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you can buy them now and use them in six months instead. But seeing Starship in flight can definitely keep you warm, especially if you're near its hot staging ring, which, by the way, worked. Booster 9 shut down 30 of its engines, which just looked spectacular. Then Ship 25 successfully ignited its six engines and separated from the booster. You can see on SpaceX's long-range views of the sequence how the ship's center engines had been gimbaled out for ignition and then were gimbaled in after that. The booster initiated its flip and started igniting the remaining 10 center engines for the boost back burn, but one of them did not ignite initially and then a number of other engines eventually kind of shut down and spittled out, including those that hadn't been turned off for staging. Views of the booster from our own Jack Byer seem to show these engines perhaps having a bad time shortly after they were restarted, with bits and pieces coming out of the engine section. 
Then, seconds later, the booster exploded, leaving behind something that could easily pass as an image from the James Webb Space Telescope. Luckily, the recovery portion of Super Heavy's flight was more of a bonus than a must-have for this specific test, so it's not a big deal. It was a bigger deal for Booster 9 to be able to push Ship 25 nearly into space and get it to an initial speed so that the ship could then go on and complete its near-orbital insertion burn. Booster 9 did just that and Ship 25 was able to get into space and burn its engines for about five and a half minutes. Then, about half a minute before the ship's burn was supposed to end, it appears like something had happened with the vehicle and the flight termination system was triggered. We don't know yet what the cause of the premature ending for both Booster 9 and Ship 25 was, but it can't be argued that these vehicles didn't perform better than the ones from the first flight. SpaceX was able to gather lots of new data that will be incorporated into new and better vehicles waiting in the wings. Hopefully, next time around, we'll have a Starship headed to Hawaii. ESA has finally completed the long-duration burn of the Ariane 6 core stage, putting the rocket one step closer to its debut flight. The test follows a lengthy test campaign of both the rocket and ground systems at the launch pad in French Guiana. Several countdown tests have been performed and earlier this year ESA and Ariane Group completed a short duration burn of the Vulcan 2.1 engine on the Ariane 6 core stage. This testing has been complemented by full scale, full duration tests of the Ariane 6 upper stage at Lampolchausen in Germany, which have qualified the stage for flight. Another test of this stage next month will fully test it under off-nominal conditions, which, if successful, will be the icing on the cake for its development program. The long-duration burn test of the Ariane 6 core stage was performed on November 23rd at 2044 UTC, firing the Vulcan 2.1 engine for 426 seconds out of the planned 470 seconds. It isn't clear why this burn was 44 seconds shorter than planned, but both ESA and Ariane Group deemed it successful. With this test checked off the list, both entities will now ready the first flight vehicle to arrive at the launch site and start pre-flight operations for Ariane 6's debut. No launch date has been set yet for this mission, but ESA promised it would decide on that date after this test was done, so we might get it sooner rather than later. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. NASA's Psyche spacecraft has tested for the first time its optical communications demonstrator, and this means laser communication was achieved for the first time in interplanetary space. The spacecraft, which is currently about 16 million kilometers away from Earth, was able to send a beam of infrared light down to the ground at a receiving telescope at Caltech Palomar Observatory. This first test was followed shortly after by an uplink test where a laser beam was sent to the spacecraft for it to receive and process. Laser communications have been done before. You may know that Starlink satellites use this technology to send information between themselves, but it has never been done from this far away. This technology promises to increase the data transfer rates by dozens of times compared to radio transmissions, so it's definitely cool that we finally have a real-life demonstration instead of just a concept. If you were wondering what India's space agency had in the works after the successful Chandrayaan-3 mission, we now know the answer. The agency is planning another Chandrayaan mission, aptly named Chandrayaan-4, which will attempt to return lunar samples from the moon. The mission will use a two-launch profile with a JSRV Mark II sending a transfer module and a re-entry module, while a launch vehicle Mark III rocket would send the ascent module and the lander module. The latter two would go straight to the moon, capture the samples and send it to lunar orbit. There, the samples would be inserted on the re-entry module and the transfer module would send it back to Earth. This would be one of India's most complex missions to date, but it's certainly not impossible. A date for this mission has not been set yet, but this is set to follow the Lupex mission currently developed in partnership with JAXA and targeting a launch in 2025. Given that, Chandrayaan-4 may come in the second half of this decade. Whereas Cosmos is set to start major testing of the Angara launch complex at Vostochny. The agency announced this week it had rolled out an Angara A5 test vehicle dedicated to ground operations. This vehicle is set to test the handling capabilities of the ground systems at the complex. It will serve as a fit check test vehicle and will also be able to be filled with actual propellants to test the ground support equipment. 
The first launch of an Angara rocket from Vostochny is not planned until the second half of 2024, but it really looks like the launch pad may be ready sooner rather than later. Landspace has announced it is planning to develop an upgraded version of its Juke 2 rocket, the Juke 3. This one would be much larger, carrying up to 20 tons to low Earth orbit, and is planned to use stainless steel for its structure. The rocket is also set to use the TQ-12 engine already used on the Juk-2, so it'll be a Methalux rocket as well. The first stage is planned to be reusable, making the rocket capable of launching 16.5 tons to low Earth orbit with downrange recovery and 11 tons to low Earth orbit with a return to launch site landing. If these numbers sound at all familiar to you, it's because they're pretty much the same performance capabilities as Falcon 9, so that's another rocket on the list of rockets trying to match Falcon 9's performance. It's getting quite long. Astrolab has announced the first payloads to go on board its Flex rover to the moon. The mission, set to fly in 2026 aboard a Starship, finally has its first customers set to ride on Flex. The list of initial payloads includes a technology demonstrator to turn lunar regolith into construction bricks for roads and buildings, an experiment to measure the impact of the lunar environment on plants, and a new way of efficiently capturing water from the regolith of areas with low concentration of water. Overall, the eight contracts signed by Astrolab to fly on its rover are valued at more than $160 million. And now let's take a look at what's coming up next week in spaceflight. A Soyuz 2.1A rocket is set to launch next week from the Plisets Cosmodrome on November 21st within a two and a half hour window that opens at 2000 UTC. The mission will be carrying the fifth Bars M surveillance satellite for the Russian Ministry of Defense. Another Starlink launch is also on tap for next week from Florida. Liftoff is set to happen within a four and a half hour window that opens on November 27th at 0400 UTC. Rocket Lab's Electron rocket is set to return to flight next week carrying the QPS Star 5 satellite on a mission dubbed the Moon God Awakens. Liftoff is set to occur within a two hour launch window that opens on November 28th at 0400 UTC. A Falcon 9 from Vandenberg is set to launch next week, carrying the first satellite of South Korea's Project 425 reconnaissance satellite program. The launch is set to take place on November 29th in the mid morning local time. This mission is set to feature a return to launch site landing, so if you're in the area, watch out for the sonic booms as the booster returns back to base for landing. And towards the end of the week, we'll have the launch of another Soyuz 2.1A. This time, it'll be from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan and carrying the Progress MS-25 resupply spacecraft to the International Space Station. Liftoff is set to occur on December 1st at 0925 UTC, with Progress expected to dock to the ISS pre-chow module on December 3rd at 1114. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Be sure to click the link in the description to get 20% off an annual premium subscription and a 30-day free trial. I'm Ryan Caton for NSF, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all again next week to recap this week in Spaceflight.